YouTube Glorious Geeks. Thank you for tuning into Oh My World, where we discuss the real issues that matter. Before we start, please hit the subscribe button, follow us, and like this video. I want to give a shout out to Sammy Rosenthal and his mom, Jennifer, who asked me to talk about North Africa a while ago. We're going to focus on Libya. Last week, rival leaders there announced a ceasefire, which should normally be a big deal, but experts are wondering whether it'll actually last. To walk it back for you, civil war broke out in Libya in 2011 after the Arab Spring, and since then, just repeatedly continued to hit the fan. There are two groups that are fighting each other to lead Libya, and the reason that's important is because each group is backed by rivaling foreign powers. Turkey backs the current Prime Minister of Libya, while Egypt and Russia and others back a prominent militant group. The problem is Libya has been teetering on the brink of collapse for a while, and the civil war there is barely about Libyans anymore. It's now become about foreign powers fighting for influence, in part because of oil, Libya has the largest oil reserves in Africa, and also because Libya sits on the Mediterranean Sea, which is a strategic opportunity for anyone who wants to place military bases there. So as you can imagine, the last thing the US wants is for Russia to increase its presence in that part of the world. Meanwhile, Libyans face continued violence, food and oil shortages, and an economy literally going nowhere. Most are saying that the statements calling for an end to the conflict have been nothing but lip service, since it seems there isn't much buy-in. I myself am not too hopeful. Have you been getting a lot of phone alerts about Huawei, but then just kind of swiping them away because you can barely follow what's going on with that? I asked you all if you understood why the US has been targeting this Chinese tech giant, and 67% of you said no. So I brought on a fellow geek to discuss. Huawei is China's largest telecoms company, and they're involved in all sorts of different tech products, like creating phones, but also producing surveillance technology that props up China's authoritarian regime. The Trump administration has been prohibiting certain kinds of trade with this company, and last week they took their strongest step so far by preventing US companies from selling semiconductor chips to Huawei. Sounds geeky, right? Well, my friend Julia Friedlander breaks it down. She was a senior sanctions policy advisor at the US Treasury Department and is currently a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. Hey, Julia, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining me today. Of course, my pleasure. So this is a really complicated issue and I'm hoping you can walk it back for us, explain the threats that Huawei poses, why the Trump administration has been targeting them and whether the latest step is about, you know, addressing national security threats or is it about crushing this company altogether? Sure. Well, it all goes back to 5G and what 5G does. So this is, we're about to roll out sort of the new age of the internet, right? Which is going to make surfing instantaneous, um, but it's also going to affect all these aspects of everyday life, um, but also um, things like the interoperability of the U.S. military and how it operates with its partners. And we realized um, that um, the U.S. and its close friends were not the leaders in this. It's actually a tech giant, a Chinese tech giant, that is not really um, an independent company. It's essentially an arm of the Chinese state. Um, and all the data that it processes is processed by the Chinese government and can be exploited by its intelligence services. So this is a problem for the everyday consumer, but also really the national security of our companies and of, um, of our real, real infrastructure of our countries. So the, the series of measures that we've taken have ramped up the pressure on the company, both to exclude its operation from the United States, but also to keep it from using component parts that are produced in the United States as part of its supply chain. Now, it may look like they're ta we're targeting the, co the, co the company specifically, but this really is based in national security concerns. The problem is, is that we can't really decouple from China. You know, there's a lot of talk about this out there, about keeping our economy separate um, and making the US economy self-sustainable and not relying on China. That is not possible. We are too globally inter interconnected from that. And the risk is that um, the US takes too many steps to target different areas of Chinese economic activity that blow back on us. Got it, interesting. All right, well, I'm glad for the insight. It makes a whole lot more sense now that it's about protecting us and our, and our, you know, our vulnerabilities. Thanks, Julia. Sure. Did you know that a military coup happened in Mali? Do you know where Mali is? Mali is a large country in West Africa that for many years has struggled with terrorism and extremist groups. France in particular, but the US as well, have both been involved in trying to support Mali's government and military to help it push back on terrorist groups there. And now military officers who receive training from the US have overthrown the government. Whoops. The US UN and most African and Western states have condemned the coup, but some Malians may be welcoming it. So what does it all mean and why does it matter? This is all actually very deja vu. By the way, my mom's gonna kill me for saying that in an American accent. Deja vu, mom. 
There was also a military coup in Mali in 2012 that ended up resulting in extremist groups taking over the northern part of the country, which is obviously a big problem because in addition to terrorizing the people, those groups reap the financial benefit of controlling those lands, which in turn allows them to spread their wings further into other neighboring countries. Back then, France led the effort to help Mali push back on those groups, and the US, UN, and others worked to build up Mali's military to fight this ongoing threat. But these extremist groups never really died down, and that's because they've been able to gain some public popularity due to the Malian government being rife with corruption and economic mismanagement. In fact, for the last two months, Malians have been protesting because of this corruption and lack of economic opportunities, among other reasons. And so experts believe these military officers took advantage of the civil strife to stage this coup. Based on what happened in 2012, the love affair for the coup throwers will likely end soon, since this could end up paving the way for terrorist groups to spread their influence further, which both sucks for Malians and would undo the work the US and others put in to fight these groups, some of which are affiliated with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Some say that the French have done such a good job in the counterterrorism operations, though, that it'll be hard to for, for these terrorist groups to expand their reach. And French President Emmanuel Macron has said that France will continue fighting Islamic extremists in Mali regardless of the coup. Love him. My man Macron is on it, so hopefully things won't take a turn for the worse. <laughs> this story got little coverage, but matters a lot, a lot. A few weeks ago, a former Saudi intelligence official filed a lawsuit in the United States accusing Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of sending a hit squad to Canada to assassinate him. The guy held a prominent intelligence position for many years in Saudi Arabia and has had a lot of success in counterterrorism efforts. He's been living in Toronto and allegedly knows a lot of damning information on the Saudi Crown Prince, which is apparently why the Crown Prince wanted him dead. According to the lawsuit, Canadian border agents became suspicious of the hit squad when they tried to enter the country at the airport with forensic tools in tow, which this dude believes were meant to dismember him, similar to what happened to Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi. OMW, what on earth? The lawsuit notes that the Saudis have also arrested two of the guy's children and have detained and tortured other relatives in an effort to get the intelligence official back to Saudi Arabia. Although the claims haven't yet been proven, it does have the ruthless, repressive, and sloppy trademark of the Crown Prince. The reason this matters is because it not only highlights what the Saudi Crown Prince is up to and how he goes after dissidents and oppositionists, but it also underscores that this stuff affects us here in North America, where the Saudi government works to intimidate or harass people abroad. Oh, and by the way, Saudi Arabia is a friend of the US and Canada, so their repression knows no boundaries, literally. For that reason, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is on my list this week. An 11-year-old boy named Abdul Rahman al-Shanti from Gaza has quickly become a social media star and hopefully a voice for peace and equality. This kid posted a video of himself rapping the lyrics of one of his favorite artists, calling for peace and love. First of all, this is our country. Let me tell you how it goes. We want peace and we will love. We will pray and teach you don't. It's a chance if you die. Let's see what the future holds. My life is on the line, right behind the bullet holes. I do it for my family. I do it for my soul. Some grew up without a family. Playing stories I'm told. My life is in the book. Some of the pages would have fold. I sim against the world. And only God knows. We have to let them know they did not die in vain. Even though they lost their family. He taught himself English by listening to music online, and he told the New York Times that his dream is to become a professional rapper and tour the United States. Well, I'm rooting for him. His video racked up over a million views, and rappers around the world sang his praises. Things took a turn, though, after an interview he had where he had said, quote, I would like to spread love between us and Israel. There's no reason for fighting in wars. His comments ended up drawing a lot of criticism in Gaza, where many took to social media to lash out at this kid and his father. Why? For promoting peace. The Gaza Strip, which is a small Palestinian area that neighbors Israel, is led by Hamas, which is a terrorist organization that advocates fighting Israel. They've worked to quash any kind of activity that could be perceived as normalizing their relationship with Israel and have previously arrested Palestinian peace activists for talking to Israelis. So talking about peace with Israel has become taboo there. Because of the backlash, the kid's dad tried to backtrack and say that his son meant he wanted peace with the world. You know I'm gonna say it straight to you. Festering in a state of war doesn't exactly forge a way ahead. Hopefully this younger generation, like the young rapper, will continue to wish for peace, speak freely, and push for a better future. I'll end with something he said that rings especially true in the United States right now, given the protests here calling for racial equality and an end to police brutality. In his interview with the New York Times, the young kid said, quote, you should treat others as you want to be treated. I wish we could stop violence and discrimination from different places and different races. Kid is wise beyond his years, and he's on my crush list this week. Thanks for geeking out with me. 
I don't want to screw your ears next week with news about conflict and human rights abuse since it's the last week of summer. So you enjoy your last week of freedom and I'll see you again after Labor Day. And of course, please hit the subscribe button below and like this video. Leave me a comment or question. Let me know if there's a story you want me to talk about. You know I'll give you a shout out if you do. And please follow Oh My World and Me on Instagram and Twitter. Stay fabulous, geeks. Oh, <laughs>